Yeah, so weights are always going to be vertically down, so only in the y direction. And so even though the arm is kind of at an angle like this, yeah. the weight is still going to be kind of pointing down. Oh, yeah. So you would have to find the weight. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Sure. And so is there any the latest one? Yeah. So assume one and zero, the other one is non-zero. <laughs> We solve it for lambda two. Lambda two is What's the merit of it? The about the actual like what is that that yeah, value? Yeah, it matter. Yeah. So the so the value for that is tells you how sensitive that result is to that constraint. And so basically, the higher the value for lambda two is, the more sensitive the constraint is. And so you know, for this case, you know, we had two x two x plus y is less than or equal to six. And so if we were to change that six to so maybe. 80 or something like that, then the lambda two basically tells you how much your optimum is going to shift. Yeah. Okay. So it's, 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 you know, the formal theory is actually quite complicated because then you would, you would basically, you basically project along the direction of that screen. And then that lambda two basically tells you, you know, if you were to change that thing, how, how far you would move in that direction. But it's, it's a basically a sensitivity analysis. And so not only does the value matter, but the sign matters too. And so if it's positive, you mean that if you, they call it if you tighten the constraint, if you make the, the 60 less, then it's going to shift in a certain direction. But if you loosen the constraint, you probably will. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Because I, I was, well, my original thought was is there a way where, let's say we did a 300 plus plus problem and we had a 300 mm -hmm. Can you group two of them? Yes. Both of them to be five directions. Can you do that or is that? Yeah. So if you so if, if you actually solve that that problem, like you you might have to go through that um, that uh, that progression because we have three inequality constraints. The first thing you would try is like, you know you try just one by one to see if you know one if just only one equality constraint. Oh, that's just that. Yeah. Okay. But then if if all of those fail, then you would go to the next thing where you assume two equality constraints. And, so you and you have to group exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which which is possible. It's just it just takes a really long time. In our case. No. Yeah. I mean, definitely, definitely not on on the exam. For, for, so, for those for those kinds of problems, you need probably something like linear programming. So, linear programming works pretty well in those cases. And that's when we will see it. Exactly. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, probably not this week, but probably next week, probably deal with it. Okay. All right, I did try. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, so, so the only thing in the x direction here would be the s map. So, both the weight and the weight of the arm, the no those are both So, so w a and w only. Do you record that? So, the x rating only has j x. So, these these ones don't. Yes. So, even though the arm is angled. The weight is always going to be kind of pointed upwards. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. 
Okay, I'm not meaning Yeah, I'm not really realistic, but the thing is, like, the pressure is bigger. Oh, no, yeah, bigger than the pressure. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. Oh, so this, so remember when you're coming up in X direction, start the root problem. And then I was not happy. I mean, I learned I have to start the root problem. All right, it's uh, five thirty. Let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everybody. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Doing good, doing good. 
Yeah, I, I, I was telling uh, my other classes that I went to a, a wedding over the weekend. And so they were for uh, two, two of my friends from high school. What was interesting is that those two people kind of were in different social groups in high school, but they, uh, so they weren't, they weren't friends for a long time. But then at our 10 year reunion back in 2019, they kind of reunited, they fell in love. And so now they're, they're here. So, uh, you know, very, very, very fun. And so at the wedding, we had kind of like, we had a lot of people from our high school there, but we had kind of two, two, two groups of people from different social groups. So two groups of people that normally wouldn't interact, but you know, we're there kind of celebrating the marriage of the same. Sean's getting married next. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> He got, so, he got a game. Oh wow! Congra congratulations. Uh, so, so some of you may know too that you know I'm I'm also planning a wedding for this year, um, but it's, it's not going to be till the end of the semester. So during the semester, I might be kind of stressed because you know my my wife is stressing me out. But uh, but I, I was telling people that you got I'm, I'm doing you guys a favor because so my my wedding is happening kind of right at the end of the semester, and so I'll be grading all your final projects like when I'm on my wedding time. So you know, I'll be very very happy when I'm when I'm grading your guys' final projects. So you know, I'm doing you guys a solid. Uh, where's yeah, the and I you had your wedding over the weekend that one time no that was my my bachelor party um oh. so i so my wife and i were already married but you know we're planning our we, we did a courthouse wedding over covid so now we're planning our wedding ceremony kind of so, so you know if you guys get very high grades on your finals because i'm i, I was very happy there you go there you go <laughs> all right uh okay um, so, um, uh, back to, back to, back to planet earth, I guess. Okay. So this week, um, it's an ANSYS week. And so on uh, Thursday of this week, we are doing our next ANSYS activity. Um, so it's ANSYS activity three. Okay. Um, so ANSYS activity three is kind of a nice breaking point. And so after we do ANSYS activity three, um, next week, we're actually going to discuss the midterm. Part. So once we're done, kind of done with ANSYS activity three, then what I tell people is that, you know, that's, that's kind of the basics of ANSYS. Um, and so from there, you know, I, 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 I you know, you do answer to activity three, you know, I have confidence that everyone can kind of do a very basic uh, analysis. So, and we'll talk about the project next week. Uh, we'll talk about how, what that entails. And then, you know, I'll give you guys about a month to work on. on the project. So the project will be due around uh, Halloween. So um, it's right after Halloween. That's a project. Yeah. Okay. So definitely, you know, look forward to that. Um, but for this week, for now, uh, we're going to be diving a little bit more into mesh. And so we're going to talk a bit more about um, element types uh, over the next few lectures. And so today we're going to talk about 2D element types. Um, next week we'll talk about 3D element types. And then the following week we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about more specialized element types called shells. And, and so you know, next two weeks are going to be all about, next three weeks are going to be all about meshing. All right, and so I think that's, uh, that's about it for my announcements. Are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go and get started. And so the topic for today is uh, 2D element types. Okay. All right, so we've, we've talked about meshing before, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, a strange concept, you know, but I think, like I mentioned before, you know, me there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of depth to meshing, and I think compared to, you know, boundary conditions and material properties, you know, meshing is a thing that's kind of really new and kind of unique to finite elements, and so we spend quite a bit of time talking about it, you know, and for good reason, there's, there's, there's a lot to do with meshing. Okay. And so we're going to start uh, kind of our tour of the different element types with the heating ones, okay? We already know that the, the 2D element types available. Okay. And so the primary 2D element types we have are um, rectangular elements. So we have our quadrilaterals. Okay. So we know that already. And so we, we know that if we if we mesh a geometry in 2D, these are our primary two uh, options, at least within ANSYS. Okay. If you if, if you use another software out there, you know, they, they have they they might have more options available, but for the most for the most part, you know, this this is kind of what you have uh, available. 
Um, and so what we're going to do um, for today is we're going to we're going to dive into kind of more into the differences between these two element types. Um, we're going to dive into their linear versions and quadratic versions, what that means, uh, and, and how that actually scales up with the cost of these uh, simulations. Okay. All right. But before we do that, uh, before we kind of dive into these element types, uh, we have to go over the concept of the shape function. So every element type, um, and, when, and when I say element type, I not only mean the shape of the element, but also its order. Okay. Every element type has an associated shape function that's um, that defines its 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 properties basically. So the question is, you know, what what is a shape function, or what you know, how do we define? It? Okay. And so, if you recall, you know, and so I, I've I've mentioned this kind of ad nauseum in this class, but you know, f f finite elements uh, in general is just a way for solving differential equations. Okay. And the way that it accomplishes this is that you know it kind of solves the equation in kind of a reverse way. Um, and so, what finite elements does is that it first it assumes a form for the solution. And so before it even starts, you know, it, it assumes, you know, what the solution is going to look like, at least uh, mathematically. Okay? And then what it does then is that it finds the best solution possible of that form that will be as close to solving the differential equation as possible. And so the shape function, uh, in essence, the shape function is basically the functional form that we're assuming from the from the beginning. And so the exact form of that shape function is different depending on you know what shape we are and kind of what order we are for that element. Okay. All right, and there's and there's lots of cool things that you could do with the shape functions too, um, in terms of kind of interpolation and, and things like that. Okay. All right, and so to kind of illustrate this, let's 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 kind of start kind of going through the elements and we'll talk about what their shape function looks like and why they kind of have a certain form. All right, so let's start. Let's start with the uh, uh, the linear quadru uh, quadrilateral. Okay. 
So the linear quadrilateral will look something like this. So you now have a rectangle. Okay. We have nodes to the corners. We'll call this node one, node two, three, or four. And so if we were to draw out the shape function for this, uh, for this element, it would look something like this, okay? So when, whenever we make a shape function for an object, you know, they all kind of follow a very similar pattern. Okay? And so the first thing that you should look at is the order of the element, okay? And so first thing you should, you should notice about this is that we're looking at a linear quadrilateral. And so that means our shape function will also be a linear, um, a linear function, okay? <laughs> And then the other thing that you should uh, take note of is the number of nodes on the element itself, okay? And I'll explain why in, in a second, okay? But for this, uh, for the, but for this particular, um, you know, shape here, or for this particular element, we have a linear function with four nodes. Okay? So let's go ahead and form the shape function. And so since we're in 2D, our shape function is going to be a function of both X and Y, okay? And let's see what this, this looks like. All right. And so whenever you're, you're making a shape function, you always have to start with a constant term, okay? So that C0 there is, is a constant. Next, we have terms that are linear in X and ter a term that's linear in Y. This term right here, linear X. This term right here is linear in Y, okay? And so of course, you know, when I say linear, that means that the exponent on the, uh, on the variable is, is one. So it's C1 times X to the first power plus C2 times Y to the first power, okay? Whereas a quadratic function, quadratic is, you know, power two, okay? But we're sticking with just linear. So those are just power. Okay. All right, and then we have one more term here, which, you know, you may argue with me after this that, you know, you may think this is not a linear term, but it technically is. Okay. So that's going to be C3x times y. So this term, you know, even, even though technically it's, it's a quadratic term because we have two variables multiplied by each other, x and y, and so that technically makes it quadratic, it's linear in both x and y individually. So what we say is that this term is a pseudo linear term. And since it involves two variables here, we call it the pseudo-linear cross term. Right, so that's our full shape function there. So T of X and Y is equal to C0 plus C1X plus C2Y plus C3X. And so if you'll notice from that expression there, you know, I have four terms overall, right? Each one with a designated C term. Okay. And so if you're wondering what those C terms are, C0, C1, C2, C3, you know, these are unknown uh, coefficients or unknown constants.
And so uh, the goal for finite elements is that, you know, the, the way that finite elements solves for the solution is that, you know, we're going to start with this form. And so, you know, before we even begin, FE is going to say that I know the solution or, you know, I'm going to assume that the solution takes this form right here. Okay. And the way that FEA basically makes sure that your solution matches the solution to the differential equation is that it solves for the appropriate values for C0 through C3. Okay. So a little bit of a long, a little bit of a long note right there, but uh, you know it, it's important. Okay. So hopefully this this kind of gives you a little bit more context to the kind of the statement that we started out with today. Where you know FEA, you know we're assuming a, a value a, a form of the solution. This is kind of the assumed form, and the way it kind of makes sure that this assumed form actually gives us our solution is that it basically chooses the values for C0, C1, C2, C. Any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. So how do so how do we go about actually solving this? Well, you know, we're 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 not going to uh, really get into it too much um, in this class. We're going to do a little bit of theory, uh, kind of closer to Thanksgiving after the uh, after the midterm projects do. Um, but let's talk let's talk a little bit about how we um, solve this. And so, you know, the concept of FEA is, is like when, when you're at least using it is a little bit deceptive, right? And so, you know, when, when you've used ANSYS for the last two activities, you know, you've produced the mesh on your, on your geometry and you produce the, your solution, okay? It, it almost looks like the solution is being solved on the elements themselves, right? And so what it kind of looks like visually is that each element kind of contains its own solution. Okay? That's actually not quite true. And so, and so when FEA actually solves for your solution, it actually first solves for the solution in each of the nodes in your in your in your mesh. So the nodes are actually kind of the, the important part. And so all the little vertices in, in your mesh, that's that's where FEA is actually solving the solution first. Okay. So let's say that you have kind of a geometry here, okay? You have a mesh on it. At each of the nodes of the mesh, that's that's where FEA is, is solving. Okay. But it doesn't look like it, right? And so when you when you look at your solutions and answers, it doesn't look like you know the solutions are solved at the nodes. You have kind of a very nice kind of color contour kind of all through wrapped. Okay. And so what's kind of happening under the hood is that even though even though the solutions are being solved at the nodes, you know, for all the areas in between the nodes, the solution is being interpolated um, from those nodal solutions.
Are you guys familiar with, with the concept of, of interpolation and kind of what that means? And so interpolation, you know, um, you know, let's let's look let's look at a 1D case for this. And so let's say that you have kind of a set of data. And so I think people, I think people first kind of get introduced to interpolation uh, in the thermodynamics class when you're kind of interpolating between the different uh, values in the in the data tables. Okay. And so let's say that you know you have a data point here, and you have a data point here. Okay. But technically, you didn't take any data, or there's no data that exists in between these two data points. Okay. But let's say that you have an application. Where you want to find out, you know, what the value for the data is, you know, maybe in between. Okay. Okay. And so you can't just kind of pull that from the table. You can't pull that from your data because it, it just doesn't exist at that. Okay. But what you do have is you have the values for the data surrounding. And so what you can do is you can assume some functional form. And so the most common, the most common case here is you assume kind of a linear relationship in between the, your two data points. And then you use that um, line there to kind of approximate what this um, value should be here. And so you get kind of usually something kind of in between the two the two data points. And so FEA does the same thing. And so when FEA, you know, if you have your nodal solutions, you know, when it goes to try to find out what the solution is in the middle of an element or in other parts of your geometry, it's going to interpolate from the nodal uh, solutions. Okay. It's just that you know um, the concept of interpolation gets kind of um, um, kind of extrapolated to two D and three D. Uh, which I think you know most people aren't uh, aren't used to. Okay. All right, and so of course, in order to do interpolation, you have to assume kind of a, a functional form, right? But luckily, we already have that assumption in our shape functions. So that's kind of you know exactly exactly what the shape functions are designed to do is to interpret. And so when you hear the term shape functions and finite elements, it, it, it comes up a lot, you know, when you're discussing finite element theory. The shape functions kind of form the basis of a lot of things. And so on the one hand, you know, it forms kind of your um, your approximation. And so uh, you know, when you're first solving the your 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 equations, you know, you have to use the shape functions to assume a function form. But then once you solve for the FDA solution, you can then use those same shape functions to interpolate to different parts of your different parts of your geometry. Okay. Any questions on any questions on that? Okay. And so in order for this to work, you know, we have to have something called um, consistency of the solution from one element to the next, okay? Because if we look at kind of the diagram that I have up here, right? This shape function here is, is only gonna be valid on this element, Let me draw, let me draw kind of two elements here to kind of illustrate that. Too. Okay. 
And so we'll call this just for the sake of um, labeling, we'll call this element A. And then the element on the right, we'll call element B. Okay. And so element A is going to have its own uh, set of shape functions. Okay. So we'll call this TA. And element B is going to have its own shape functions as well. And so we'll call this TB. And so, you know, that's fine. And so every element can have its own shape functions. And in fact, they, each element needs, needs to have its own shape functions in order to, uh, in order to, for the FDA method to work. Okay. But when we go from one element to the next, you know, even though these, these shape functions are, are different, you know, there has to be some consistency, right? And so you can't have the solution, you know, let's say that we're solving for temperature, right? And so let's say that, you know, we're solving a, a, a heat transfer simulation, okay? And so we can't have the temperature suddenly, you know, rise through this element. Okay? Then when we transition from one element to the next, you know, that, te that temperature all of a sudden is really cold, right? There has to be kind of a smooth connection of, of, of the solutions between the elements. And so in other words, you know, there has to be, there, there has to be some relationships between the shape functions from one element to the next. And the way that we do that is we ensure, or we, we basically enforce that the nodal solutions are the same, you know, between the two. And so for the neighboring nodes, basically for this node and this node, which connects those two elements, we have to make sure that the solution is the same or whatever we get for a finite element solution is the same at these nodes in element A and in element B. And so that actually kind of gives us the criteria that we need to actually solve for the values for C0, C1, C2, C3. Okay. So let me go ahead and draw a single element again. So let me go ahead and label these. Um, I labeled the nodes already, one, two, three, four. Okay. But I'm gonna add something new to, these, uh, to this element that we didn't have before, which is gonna be the nodal solutions at each of those nodes, okay? So T1, T2, T3, T4, those are the nodal FEA solutions at each of those nodes. And so those nodal solutions are valid throughout the entire mesh, okay? And so we have to basically choose our shape function to ensure that it matches those solutions.
And so this kind of gives us a, a way to form a system of equations to solve for C0, C1, C2, C3. Okay. okay. And so for node one, we'll say we'll assume that the physical location for node one is x1, y1. For node two, we're going to assume its physical location is x2, y2. For node three, it's going to be x3, y3. And node four is x4. Okay. And so basically what we have here is that when we uh, when we apply our shape functions at x1 and y1, then our then our solution has to be equal to t t of x1 on y1. And so we plug that into our shape function, we get c0 plus c1 x1 plus c2 y1 plus c3 x1 y1. This has to equal t1. We have the same thing at x2 and y2. So c0 plus c1 x2 plus c2 y2 plus c3 x2 y2. This has to equal to t2. Then same thing at uh, uh, x3, y3. And then the same thing at x4 and, and y4. All right, and so in theory, you know, what we have here is a system of four equations of four unknowns, okay, where the unknowns are C0 through C3, okay. And so in theory, you can solve this. Okay? We're not gonna do that because I'm not evil. At least I like to think that I'm not evil, okay. Um, but in theory, you can, you can, you can solve this, this system. All right. So that's so that's kind of a little bit of background information of, of you know um, you know when you have an, when you have an element type you know it's defined by its its shape and its its order okay and so that that determines kind of the form for the shape function and then you know this is kind of a little bit of information on kind of what the shape function is is used okay. it's used for assuming the solution it's assumed for uh, it's used for interpolation and it's also used to kind of enforce consistency of the solution um, as you kind of go through the and so part of the reason why you get kind of very smooth contours and very smooth kind of uh, graphs when you're using ANSYS is because ANSYS uses, um, you know, shape functions like, like these to, to enforce its solution. All right, any questions on, any questions on this? Okay, all right, so let's go on, let's move on to the next element type. So the next element type that we're going to talk about is the quadratic quadrilateral. And so again, it's going to be a quadrilateral element. And so it's going to have uh, four sides to it. One, two, three, four. Okay. So we're gonna have nodes at the corners, just like just like we did before. The only difference here is that our shape function is now going to be a quadratic function. So it's gonna have powers of two for x and y. Okay. So let's go ahead and start writing out the, the form for this. Okay, so we're gonna have t of, of x and y, right? So just like just like before, we're in 2D, so we have uh, x and y. We start with our constant term, c0. 
We're going to have C1x, C2y. And so, you know, even though we have a quadratic function, we have to kind of build our way up there. So we have to include um, the constant term and all the linear terms along the way. We're going to include the, uh, uh, the cross term. Okay? So everything that the linear uh, quadrilateral has, the quadratic one is going to have as well. Okay? So the first four terms here are the same as the same as the linear. It's linear, um, you know, it's linear friend. But you know, if we if we kind of stop, we kind of pause here, we can see that we we have kind of a problem, right? And so we have four terms uh, in our shape function right now, okay? But you know, you can argue that, you know, four terms, all we can do, because if you look at kind of the, our previous kind of system right here, each node kind of gives us a, an equation for us to solve for in the, uh, in this kind of linear system. Okay. And so if we only had four nodes, our, our shape function can only have four, uh, four terms. In it, okay. So we have one term per node, but if we do that for the quadratic quadrilateral, you know, we're not even able to reach up to the quadratic terms because we don't have enough nodes. Okay? And so one thing that you'll notice um, for all the quadratic terms, and so you'll notice this for the quadratic triangle as well, is that in order for us to kind of reach those higher order terms, we have to add more nodes to the element. So we have to add the more node, otherwise it's not going to be possible to reach those quadratic those quadratic terms. And so typically, what's done is that we we can add nodes to this element. That's 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 not a problem. Um, the issue is kind of where should we put them. Okay. And so for the quadratic element, we usually add the nodes in the middles of each of the edges of the element. Okay. And so for each edge of the element, we're going to add one node in the middle. Okay. So this is, and so since our element here has four, has four sides, we're going to add four nodes. Okay. We node five, six, seven, eight. Okay. <clears throat> and so since we're adding these nodes in the middles of the edges, we usually call these mid nodes. And with their addition, you know, we're able to kind of bring up the order of our, of our shape function. Okay. All right, so now we can do a C4 term. Okay. So C4 term is going to be our classic x squared. C5 is going to be y squared. Okay. We have two more nodes. So we can do a C6. So C6 is going to be x squared y, and C7 is going to be x, y squared. So basically every combination of quadratic terms that you can think. And of course, you know, if you look at C6 and C7, technically those are cubic terms because you have an x squared times a y. And so the total power of that is three, but individually, you know, we only have just x squared. Um, and the y is only linear. So well, technically, those are quadratic terms. Okay. 
All right. And so in order, and so you know, in order to reach quadratic status for for most elements, you know, we have to add nodes to the uh, to the element. Any questions on on this? Yeah. Why do we stop at C seven and not about C eight for like another cross term this time? Yeah. So the uh, so C seven is is actually the the eighth uh, the eighth term. Uh, because we started at C0, so okay. we had C0. So C0 counts as one, and then C7 is the eight. Okay, so you can't go to X squared, Y squared, if you're adding them. So. No, yeah, so if, if you did, so there there are elements like that. And so, you know, the next the next place to put an element or put a node, I'll be right in the middle. And so if we added a ninth node, that would be that would be the X squared, Y squared. X squared, Y squared. Yeah, but typically we stop at the edges just because you know, otherwise it kind of gets a little bit messy to the path. Question in the chat. Question: uh, Why do we need to add more nodes? Yes, yeah, so we need to add more nodes because you know we wanted to um, make we wanted to make our shape function into a quadratic function, um, and so we wanted to basically incorporate the x squared, the y squared terms, uh, and we weren't able to do that with the linear element because the um, or with the four nodes um, because with four nodes we're only we only have enough um, we only have enough nodes to cover these terms right here. And you can't and you can't make a shape function that jumps directly to x squared or y squared uh, because you know finite elements they have this other um, kind of requirement called completeness and so with com under completeness you know you need to have all the all the prerequisite all the preceding terms before you jump to the higher order terms okay. so we need to we need to add those terms we need to add those nodes to get us up the quadratic. All right, any other questions on, on this? Okay. okay. And so of course, you know, more, more nodes uh, also means more work. And so this, uh, so this extra, these extra nodes don't, don't come for free. Okay. And so, you know, when you have more nodes per element, you know, it's gonna cause, it's gonna, it's gonna cost more, or it's gonna, it's gonna cause your computer to work harder to find a solution. And so, um, generally speaking, quadratic elements uh, are more expensive on a per element basis. And so if you were to compare your finite element solution, so you have a mesh, uh, a linear mesh with, you know, a fixed amount of elements. So let's say that you have 10,000 elements on a linear mesh and you have 10,000 elements with a quadratic mesh. The quadratic mesh is going to be more expensive because it just has more nodes to compute. Okay. But, you know, like we talked about before with meshing, you know, usually if, if you if you kind of add some computational costs, you, you get some benefit from that as well. And so on a per element basis, quadratic elements are more accurate than linear elements. And so what that means is that if you're if you're using a quadratic mesh, um, you can get away with using less elements than you typically would with a linear mesh.
but there's so there's a trade off. Okay. And in fact, you know, um, if, if you read certain kind of finite element textbooks or certain kind of finite element theory, they're, they're going to talk about kind of two levels of refinement. And so, you know, if you have a mesh that you know is too coarse, you're not achieving the level of accuracy that you think that you should achieve. Um, there are a couple ways that you can refine your mesh. So kind of the traditional way, uh, which they call H level refinement, is to just make the elements smaller. And so you, you, you literally refine the mesh, make them smaller, and so that you, you achieve a higher level of accuracy. The other way that you could refine the mesh is that maybe you keep the element size the same, but you increase the order. So that's called P level refinement. And so if you hear those terms in, in uh, you know, I, you know it's, it's becoming less common nowadays, but, you know, there's still some text and so some people that kind of talk that way. And so when you when you hear H level refinement, what that means is that you're making the, just the element smaller. P level refinement means that you're increasing the order. So they both they both achieve the same goal, and would just you know to, to make your finite element a simulation more accurate. It's just the way that you approach it is is, is, is different. But I think this is kind of interesting because it kind of gives you a, a, another layer of, of kind of ways that you can you can customize your mesh to kind of fit your scenario. Okay. For me personally, um, you know, for for the most part, I do I do mostly H level refinement, just because just because visually it's a lot easier to see when your elements kind of get smaller in an area. Then you can you can then you know for sure that your your mm -hmm. home, your your solution is going to be more accurate there, uh, but there there might be some solution for p level refinement is is better. Um, so one thing oh question is can you talk? Uh, I remember like we started the class we have like a student versus the man says so we're limited on elements. Mm -hmm. Is it also limited on nodes? Um, so the uh, the the limitation is primarily on elements. Um, and so you, you can have as many nodes as you want, as long as the element is below. So you can like squeeze a little bit more accuracy out of these versions by going like quadratic. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But actually, you know, if you're going to do structural simulation, and, and we'll talk about this, maybe not today, I don't know if, don't know if we're going to get to it. But if you're going to do structural simulations, almost always you want to use quadratic elements, because there's an issue called shear mocking, which we'll, which we'll get to. Kind of get into. Okay. Or not today, though. eventually we'll do. And yeah, so but and if you're if you're working with a, a license like a student license, I would say almost always you should go for quadratic elements, just because you know there's there's no limitation. On it. So you know, go for that. You know, push the element count as high as you can, and that's that's the most accuracy. Add kind of further adding elements. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right, question. So, uh, does increased element order, order may increase the number of elements uh, or make the elements bigger? So the the element size is determined primarily just by the the edge size, and so that and so that's independent of the order. And so in, if you increase the element order, um, you're going to increase the number of nodes, um, just because you know the elements need to add more nodes to to get the shape function up there. But it, it doesn't have any effect on the size of the yeah, or the number of elements. But it does it does affect the number of Okay, so that's so that's the quadrilateral element. So let's let's move on to the triangular triangular elements. Okay, so let's talk about the linear triangular um, elements. Let's go ahead and draw a triangle. And just like any good triangle, triangle has three nodes. We're doing the linear version here, so we're not going to add any mid nodes. So we only have three, we only have three nodes to work with. Right. 
So drawing the shape function or writing out the shape function for this, we're going to see it has three terms to it. And so our shape function for a linear triangle element is uh, C0 plus C1x plus C2. So it looks very similar to our linear quadrilateral, uh, but of course, you know, we're, we're missing that term at the end, okay? So there's no, there's no mixed term at the end. And so what we have here is, is, is you know, what I call kind of a pure, a pure linear function where you know, we don't have any kind of mixed pseudo terms or anything like that. We just have the constant, we have an X term, and we have a Y term. That's, that's it. All right. And so if you compare this to the linear quadrilateral, you, you know, obviously we have one less node and one less term to our shape function. And so continuing on with, with kind of the trend that we've, we've been seeing, right? So that this, this, this basically tells us that on a per element basis, you know, the, the linear triangle is going to have less accuracy than the linear quadrilateral. Okay. And that's and that's pretty consistent with kind of what we talked about when we when we first kind of introduced meshing, right? And so when we first introduced meshing, you know, we talked about how you know generally it's it's if you can if you can if you can make it work, the rectangular elements are generally more desirable than the than triangular ones, okay? And you can kind of see kind of the mathematical reasons for it here. So you know, just having more just just having more nodes in its element um, allows the shape function to have more terms, which makes the whole thing more. But of course, you know, triangles have, have a very unique advantage. Um, and this advantage basically uh, makes it so that, you know, in some cases, you're, you're basically forced to use triangles and that triangular elements can mesh any geometry. So I added that little tagline there just because I, I just remembered in the past, you know, um, you know, people will take like a very complicated geometry and they'll try to mesh it with triangles or tetrahedrons 
but they'll give it like a massive size. And so, you know, and so of course, ANSYS is going to fail in those cases because, you know, you have, you have to make the element small enough. And so, you know, as long as you have a sufficiently small size, then triangles and tetrahedrons are usually very reliable in terms of getting, um, you know, getting, getting your geometry mesh. Okay. But of course, you know, that comes as a downside where like you, you on a per element basis, they're less accurate. Um, generally speaking, you know, the elements don't, the triangular elements don't fill the space as well. And so it's going to take you more, um, more, more time and more elements to, to fill the space. And so, you know, generally, if you end up using triangular elements, you're going to end up paying more um, computational costs because it takes more elements, takes more, takes more computations to solve the same simulation as if you were uh, compared to rectangular elements. Okay. But that is very nice. So, you know, and especially when, when you guys are working on your final projects, I would say the vast majority of final projects where, you know, you guys are gonna be working on, on pretty complex geometries because you're working on your senior design projects and, and other stuff. Um, for the most part, you're probably gonna use triangular elements just because uh, it's hard to get kind of the rectangular elements in for All right, any questions on the, on the linear triangles? Okay, all right, let's look at the quadratic triangles. I'm going to just uh, once again, we're going to draw a triangle here. We label all the nodes. So label one, two, and three. Okay. And then just like we did with the quadratic quadrilateral, you know, we're going to add the nodes in the middles of the of the edges. Okay. We're going to add a node here, 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 four. Six. Okay. And so even with the mid nodes in this case, you know, we only reach up to six nodes. And so, you know, once again, you know, we're going to see that our, our quadratic triangle is going to be less accurate than its than its companion, the quadratic um quadrilateral. Okay. The shape function in this case, T of X, Y. Zero plus C one X plus C two Y. We're going to add the cross term, and so we're going to add the X Y term there. Okay. And then we're going to add the first order quadratic term, so C four X squared and C five Y squared. All right, so that's so that's what the uh, shape function looks like for the quadratic triangle. Okay. So less terms, less terms than the uh, quadratic quadrilateral, but a vast improvement over the linear triangle in terms of in terms of that. Okay. All right. So I think I think we will have time for this, and so we have about fifteen more minutes. Uh, so I I don't have anything more to say about the quadratic triangle, and so you know it's, it's, at this point it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but like I mentioned before, you know, um, when you're when you're working uh, on structural finite elements, especially when you're working on with a software that has a hard uh, limitations on the on the element on the elements, um, you're going to want to use quadratic elements. And we're going to talk about kind of a reason why, which is called shear bond. So shear locking, uh, the way it's presented in, in, in the textbook is that it's presented as a case for quadratic elements.
not that we not that we need any more persuasion because you know um, just just based on kind of everything we talked about today um you know it's, it's kind of clear that quadratic is uh, is kind of the superior element type here okay um but you know um this textbook was was kind of uh, written under the assumption that you don't have ANSYS um, to use. Okay? So ANSYS, ANSYS kind of spoils you a little bit because for ANSYS, you know, switching from linear to quadratic elements is just kind of a, a couple of mouse clicks. Um, but you know, if you were developing your own software or if you were you're using a software that's not as well developed as ANSYS, you know, it's it's not as trivial to go from linear to quadratic. So um, you know, especially with a lot of the codes that I ran before. Um, you know, they were mostly fluids codes, but I remember in those codes there there was there was no option for quadratic elements at all. So you had to you had to learn how to make it work with them. Uh, but with ANSYS, it makes it very easy. So you know, there's kind of no reason to to not use quadratic. Uh, but we'll talk about kind of what can happen in kind of a worst case scenario. Okay. All right. And so shear mopping is is a phenomenon that that happens uniquely in structural finite elements. Okay. So when you're using finite elements to to solve solid mechanics problems. In particular, um, it, it happens it happens to the quadrilateral too, but to a lesser degree. But but largely, this is a problem when you use linear triangular elements. We'll talk about why it, it, it's uh, the linear quadrilateral is a little bit resistant to this, but not not completely. Um, but you know, it, it, it all kind of has to do with the form of the shape function. All right. And so the reason this happens is it's kind of be, it's kind of due to the unique mathematical form um, for the solid mechanics equation. Okay. And so before I kind of jump into that, let's let's recall the fact that you know when you're solving structural finite elements, the first or the primary solution variable that ANSYS will solve for is the deformation or the displacement. Okay. And so by primary solution variable, what I mean is that this, this is what ANSYS solves first. And so when you, when you directly solve the differential equation, the first thing that pops out is the displacement of the deformation. So once you have the displacement deformation, you can compute things like the strain and the stress, but that usually involves taking gradients or taking derivatives of your displacement deformation.
which by itself, you know, doesn't seem like an issue, right? And so we, we have our, we have our displacements, we have our deformations, we just take its derivative and then, you know, we get everything that we, that we need, okay? The structural finite element equations are, are kind of unique in that the stress and the strain are directly incorporated back into their equation. So, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of like this iterative procedure where, you know, uh, if that structural FDA will solve for the displacements, from the displacements, we, we compute the stresses and the strains, and then those are fed back into the equation to kind of update the displacements, okay? And so it's, it's kind of this kind of cyclical, cyclical, cyclical thing. And so generally, you know, when, when you solve a static structural simulation, the FEA will solve for the deformations or it'll solve for its initial guess for the deformations. From that initial guess, it'll compute the stresses and the strains, and then it'll feed those back into the equation to update the deformations. And then it kind of continues on with kind of this iterative procedure several times, okay? The problem with this is that when you compute derivatives or gradients, you know, the mathematically what you're doing is you're, you're computing gradients on the shape functions themselves. And so this becomes an issue when you have a linear shape function, okay? And so let me let me write down the uh, the shape function for the linear triangle again. Okay. And so for the linear triangle, we have kind of a purely linear shape function. So C0 plus C1x plus C2. Okay. If we were to take derivatives of this, even just the first derivatives, and so if I were to take the partial derivative of t with respect to x, we would get c1. And if we take, we're take and if we were to take the partial deriv derivative with respect to y, we'd end up with c2. The issue with this is that both of these are constants. And so what that means is that, you know, when we compute things like the strain and the stress, right? And so let's let's take our linear elastic material as an example, right? And so our stress is just going to be just basically the Young's modulus multiplied by those by those constants. Right? And so what this means is that if, if your mesh is particularly coarse, so you don't have a, a lot of, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of elements in a particular area, what you're gonna have is kind of regions of space where the stress does not change at all. Okay, so you have regions of constant stress in, in certain regions.
And so that right there is a problem because if you have if you have a region of, of, a, of a geometry with constant stress, generally that doesn't happen unless your deformations are kind of small. And so, and so kind of visually kind of this, and this kind of feeds back into itself kind of multiple times. So, but visually kind of what you see is that the deformations are very, very small or much smaller than you would expect in those, in those areas. Okay? And so kind of the, uh, the, kind of the conclusion or kind of the result of shear locking is that, you know, the, the, the geometry itself kind of looks like it's kind of locking up, like it's kind of seizing up. And so the deformations that you compute are, are, much, are very, very small. And so you don't have this issue when you use quadratic elements, because when you have quadratic elements, the quadratic terms, you know, when you take derivatives of those quadratic terms, you still get a linear function. And so you still get um, kind of cases where your stress can actually vary within your element, and that kind of alleviates a lot of, a lot of these issues. Okay? But if you have a purely linear element, then when you take derivatives, you get a constant, and then um, you know, uh, that, that can cause this issue. So the linear quadrilateral, you know, because it has that mixed term, it's 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 a little bit resistant to this because you do have kind of that uh, that variation, but that variation is is always in the perpendicular direction because you know when you take the derivative, you know you get a term either y or, or x which is perpendicular to the direction that it's looking at, and so it's a little bit resistant to it, but it's not completely immune. So you know, and so you know the question, you know, the, the question always when you're doing structural finite elements is that you know. If you're using linear elements, you have to refine the mesh enough so that you don't have this happen. But you know the better thing would just to be to not worry about it at all and just to always use quadratic elements. So when you're doing structural FEA, you know almost always you're going to use quadratic elements. It's only very very niche kind of very kind of specialized cases where you would use linear elements in these cases. All right, any final questions on this before we wrap it up for for today? Okay. All right. So that's all I got planned for today. And so when I see you guys on Thursday, we'll be doing Antis Activity 3. Um, and so I'll post the activity. I know it's a little bit late last time, so I'll try to post it uh, tomorrow. Um, oh, I, I still owe you guys solutions for the first two activities. And so I'm going to post that uh, tomorrow as, as well. Uh, so, yeah, so I apologize for going to be in tomorrow. So thank you guys for coming today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. And I will see you guys on Thursday. I know you Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can, uh, so that's Saturday. Yes. Okay. Saturday. Yeah. I'd be. Yeah. I'd be. I'd be happy to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's cool. Now I'll get you in contact with um, Sam. Okay. Cool. I, I'm technically an advisor for probably to yes. but then I I don't do it. <laughs> so yeah. I should, that's I your stuff. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So yeah, send me the information. Okay. I'd, I'd be happy. To. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know you have a lot of I didn't say that. Why? What? They go to the thing. He just means like quite. Any final question? I'm not going to get it. All right, I'll see you uh, a few minutes.